My name is Evan Folds. Uh, I'm an elected supervisor of New Hanover Soil and Water Conservation District, and my consulting company is called V Agriculture. And I'm going to speak today about organic land care, and um, I'm also recently starting a food lawns project that is looking to help people get more functionality out of their landscapes. So I've been on a, this journey for um, about 17 years, and I, I've uh, had a or retail organic uh, hydroponic biodynamic garden center uh, for 14 years. And for about a three year period, I ran an organic lawn care company out of that retail store. And this was one of the flowers that we used. And I developed a, a process of growing soil, not just plants. Uh, it's really the nutshell of you know, what we're gonna talk about today. It, the, the reality is that the effort of trying to grow a lawn or any landscape plant directly is, is if it's done artificially and with man-made materials is, is growing the plant at the expense of the soil and at the expense of the ecosystem. So it's really important to recognize that landscapes or ecosystems lost on many of us. Um, you know, there, there is living process in the soil uh, that we'll talk about from um, microscopic organisms called microbes and um, plants feed the soil uh, exudates and there's this kind of uh, this food web that happens uh, not unlike what happens in the ocean that uh, grows the capacity of the soil to accomplish what it can and what we, we typically deal with in a landscape is very uh, immature soil you know the, the nature of development uh, when a uh, contractor or a builder you know builds a house they're either taking the top foot of, of soil off which is where all the action happens or they're bringing in cheap sanitized fill that is devoid of any life. And the microbes that make soil don't jump over the fence, you know? So it's really, really important uh, to keep them front and center. Uh, and ultimately, a lot of, you know, this exercise is really removing the human from the equation. Um, you know, we get ourselves into, in the way of these natural processes and it really discourages the type of success that we can have. But one of the ironies that we saw with the natural approach was you know, people tended to be more concerned with their animals than they were with themselves uh, when it came to lawn chemicals. And, you know, there's this, an irony in there, but the, the flip side to that is that, you know, dogs and animals in general have their noses in the ground. You know, they're closer to these chemicals. There's a, a laundry list of documented uh, science around um, cancers uh, linked directly to pesticides and lawns that exists, it's, it's common knowledge at this point. There's not as much on humans, but that is changing. Um, but it's, it's just really important to recognize that, you know, when we spray something on a landscape that we don't want to go near, uh, it should cause us some pause. Um, so there, there's a way in which I've developed to talk about this uh, that I like to call bioenergetic agriculture. And the, the, the recognition is that there's a physical, mineral, biological, and energetic capacity to a living system. And if you think about um, you know, conventional growing, uh, farming is an easy way to think about it, or a lawn, uh, you know, it's physical and it's mineral. You know, we're plowing and we're aerating the soil to break it up because it's dead. And we're fertilizing to grow the plants. And then we tend to kind of try to kill all the problems that are created back, right? And that's conventional agriculture. Uh, organic agriculture brings in the biological component where you have life in the soil and you, you recognize that uh, there's a different level to, to the system that we're working with, uh, but they both completely discount this idea of life force or that there's more to life than what's physically here. That's typ typically championed by what's called biodynamic agriculture. Uh, it's not really the scope of what we'll talk about today, but it's really fascinating if you're interested. Uh, today, I really wanted to talk about the mineral and the biological components. Um, so soil on paper is organic matter, clay, and sand. Um, it's much more dynamic than that. You know, sand, if you buy potting soil to put plants in, house plants in, something like that, those little white specks in the, in the potting soil is called perlite. And that's there to allow drainage. It's, it, that's the function of what sand plays in soil. We've got plenty of sand, right? Um, more than we want in most cases. And we really lack clay except for small pockets with, throughout the county. Uh, but typically it's a sandy, sandy type soil. And you know we lack organic matter typically as well. We, we live near the beach. We don't have you know feet of topsoil to take advantage of. And again, when you develop property, you tend to take a lot of that off. 
Um, so the focus of growing the soil is really a function of increasing the organic matter. Um, and, and along with recognizing that it's so much more than just the sum of these parts, um, you know, it, it is a living organism. And what we tend to do is fertilize. You know, this is a typical lawn fertilizer. You see the NPK, the three numbers on it. The 34 is the N, 0, P, and 4K. You see that on fertilizers because it's mandated by law, um, but it's a bit of a, a misnomer. There's a, a lot more that a plant has to have to grow, and there's a lot more than that that a plant wants. And We're going to talk about that briefly. Uh, so what these kinds of fertilizers amount to is, is really fast food, right? And I mean, what happens to people when they eat fast food for every meal? We make movies out of it, right? Like you watch Super Size Me or any of these movies, right? We've already made these connections, yet we're going through motions that uh, don't reconcile and ultimately undermine what we want when we're asked. And that's something that's really important to recognize in some of these things. It's not necessarily a, a product driven thing. It's really the mentality that the soil is alive. How do I get the system to work rather than make it my responsibility to grow it? Uh, and again, that's an exercise of removing the plant, uh, the human from the situation. The plant food is, you know, it, one of the amazing things about plants is photosynthesis results in plants manufacturing their own food. They use the raw materials of air, light, water, and um, ions or elements uh, that represent the food that the plant has to have. So this typically is what people mean when they say fertilizer. Uh, it's, it's actually quite an interesting thing to try to define. But essentially, it's, it's any kind of substance added to increase the fertility of the situation. Just like fast food can, can fill our caloric intake and you know, prevent our hunger pangs and you know, prevent uh, uh, hunger in that regard, it's not nourishing our bodies on a level uh, that if we were articulate about it, we, we would want. Um, and so it's, it's also not harming us directly, arguably. It's just creating a deficiency over time. And in fertilizer, it's, it's somewhat the same way. And we're gonna, we're gonna see that really clearly in a second, but it's really important to recognize that fertilizer is a crutch. You know, fertilizer is not something that's required uh, in a living system. Matter of fact, you know, a prairie is not fertilized, right? There, there's a system in a, uh, that can handle itself. And so that's really the goal. Now, whether we get to uh, your landscape growing itself or not um, is not really the point. The point is to, not, to, to move in that direction. And the residual benefit that we get as we move in, in that direction is profound and exponential, and it gets better and better and better with time. If we're fertilizing, it's going to get worse and worse and worse over time. Um, and, and that gets into a little bit of the specifics that we'll talk about in a couple of slides here. But um, the, the first articulation is artificial fertilizers and organic fertilizers. There's a lot of people that evaluate organic fertilizers as being good for the earth and the right thing to do, and they are those things. But the most important aspect of it is that it's recognized as a food source by the ecosystem. If it's man-made, it's being introduced from left field. The, the, the ecosystem, the natural ecosystem, doesn't recognize it, and it creates havoc. You know, it, it, in a lot of cases, especially with the pesticides, it's going to kill. They're designed to kill, right? So we're, we're actually telling ourselves, man, we want to encourage life in our landscape and we're trying to do it with death, you know? And that, that's a, a stark statement, but it's really important to understand um, the destruction that we're, we're creating by, by not meeting the ecosystem with where it wants to be met. Uh, not to mention these, you know, synthetic fertilizers that are man-made will run off into our, into our waterways and create algal blooms. And it's a lot of what's happening in Greenfield Lake is that residual runoff from all of these materials being used all around the lake and, and the water that's coming into the lake from all over in the, in the watershed um, have, a, have a tremendous impact. So organic fertilizers are just are, are forms of fertilization that are recognized by the life in the soil. Um, and it allows you to grow the soil while you're feeding the plant. So I included this slide, you know, I have a, a pretty deep background in hydroponics. And, you know, it occurred to me one time thinking through some of these things that the way we're growing our landscapes is treating it like a big hydroponics system. And what I mean by that is, you know, in hydroponics, you have water with nothing in it for the mindset. Um, so you have to bring all of the fertility, right? And it, in that respect, you have to pay attention to what the plant requires because if it's missing, the plant can't grow. So we'll see this in, in, in data in a second, but what that ends up doing is you can also, you know, 
make the concentration of what you're you're growing ideal for the for the plant um, and, and it results in plants growing up instead of down um, and so depending on how you're growing and what you're growing this can be a benefit but in, in the example that I'm trying to draw here what you know imagine your grass and your lawn you know we're using nitrogen fertilizer the grass is growing more rapidly it's greening up by appearance it's looking like it's working right and we're saying, oh, wow, it's making it grow faster. It's greener. It looks great. What's really happening is that you see the plant on the right there. There's no root system. You know, we're not growing the grass for tomatoes. Uh, and, and the result of that is a very weak plant. Uh, and actually, the same thing can be true in hydroponics as well. Uh, the root system is really, really important to establish a perennial lawn and a grass. And, a, you know, a really easy thing you can do uh, just to kind of test where you're at with your root system, just go out into your lawn and, you know, Put your, you know, even dig a little hole and just, or, or get a, a soil probe if you have one and just check how far down the roots go. Uh, most of the time, it's not more than a quarter of an inch to half an inch. Those roots should be six inches down in the ground at least. Um, so this is one of the things that stimulates weeds to grow uh, is to break the soil up so that the perennial grass can succeed that the annual weed and uh, the ecosystem matures. So we'll talk through um, that towards the end a little bit more detail. But there's a, a principle called the law of the minimum. And, and I'll show you a listing of what's called the essential elements. Uh, and there's 13 of them. Some will say 17, some say 13. It's somewhat uh, arguable. But there's a minimum of, of 13 elements that a plant has to have to grow. So that hydroponic nutrient wouldn't work in the water scenario unless all 13 of those are present. Now remember we were talking about the NPK. That's only three right so you can see just from the get-go people's attention is very limited in regards to what's required not what's wanted but what's required for the system to grow and what we'll talk through is that weeds pests and diseases are manifestations of these types of deficiencies so the law of the minimum says if you have 13 elements to grow and i'll talk through in a second the ideal ratios and levels of what's needed um, but if we've got an imbalance or a deficiency in a single element of one of those that's required, the chain is only as strong as the weakest link. The whole system becomes limited by any one of the essential elements um, deficiency. So it's, it's kind of uh, illustrated in that image down there. Uh, this, there was a man named Justice von Liebig who came up with this uh, postulate uh, in the 1800s. So th there's another concept here, and this can look technical and don't really feel like in the test obviously but don't feel like you need to remember this more just want you to feel it you know Th this is called Mulder's chart and what it's saying is there's certain elements that are antagonistic and there's certain elements that are are beneficial to one another and then further from that there's ratios of each element to the other that you can use to establish a posture of health and soil and this was um uh, talked about by um Dr. William Albrecht and he developed a lot of this work back in the 1940s so I put this slide in here to kind of cap off some of what I've been talking about. You know, we have those essential elements, right? And, and within that, you have what's called macronutrients and micronutrients. You may have heard those terms before. Macronutrients is the NPK. It's calcium, magnesium, things that are needed in, in more uh, higher amounts, more abundance. The plant's metabolism requires more of them. The micronutrients typically are needed in much more minimal amounts, uh, trace amounts even. And then there's trace elements, which are elements that are required by the ecosystem. Maybe not by the plant directly, but by the microbes that live in the soil. I mean, why would Mother Nature make an element not needed in the soil, right? So the, the idea that we've limited, well, this is all we need to have. I mean, you can see the problem there from the get-go, right? So this, this is a, a earth tonic is a, a fertilizer product that we made out of ocean water, uh, a former company of mine. And we take ocean water and supersaturate Himalayan crystal salt, which is a different spectrum of elements, and then uh, different other salt sources. And then we put some uh, potentized herbs in there and made this material. And you can see the elemental coverage in the earth tonic versus a typical fertilizer. And it, it's just more tools, right? Like try building a house with half the tools. You know, what's going to happen? You're going to get inefficiencies. You're going to get pest infestations, diseases, what that translates to. So it's not just about what the, what the system has to have or what the plant has to have, it's what the ecosystem wants. And that's really a big takeaway um, from using organic fertilizer. So you, you know, put, put a number on that, you know, a hydroponic nutrient may have those 13 elements. Well, 
you know, a, a plant wants much more than that, you know? And, and so that, that's an entirely different conversation. And this is just another view of it. You know, you can see that hydroponic nutrients going to have down to the cobalt, but it's, it's missing everything else. And the earth tonic's got over 90 elements in it, uh, every element on earth. That's one of the amazing things about seawater. And it's interesting. A lot of people may be wondering, well, you can't use seawater for fertilizer. Well, you just need to dilute it, right? Um, just like you would miracle Grow. You know, if you poured miracle Grow on a plant, it would burn it, right? And incidentally, what burns a plant you know, it would be helpful but maybe have a visual, but if you have sodium chloride's table salt, if you dissolve that in water, it turns into a sodium and a chlorine ion. And plants eat the ions. So the concentration of those ions is called the parts per million or the electrical conductivity. And if you're familiar with burning a plant where you put too much fertilizer in the presence of a plant, the edges of the leaves burn, and it, it kind of starts to die back a little bit, which, what you're doing is reversing the osmotic gradient in the root. So transpiration, and I'm throwing a lot at you, but uh, what'll stick is, is uh, what sticks is needed in, in some respects, but transpiration is, is when the plants use water from the ecosystem and lose it through their leaves, and there's this pump that happens that brings fertility into the plant. And if you had too many ions outside the root, that gradient that allows the plant to use the water is reversed. And so the plant loses water and it burns at the edges of the leaves. So as long as you're paying attention to the concentration of the fertilizer that you're using, uh, there really is not a problem uh, with sea mineral fertilizer. And you know, one, one other thing that I would add is that you know, it, sea minerals are not really a good base fertilizer. What I mean by that is the NPK, the macronutrients that it contains, is relatively low. So it's a good supplemental fertilizer that adds all of the elements. Again, the mindset being, why would Mother Nature make an element not needed in the soil? Um, and especially when they're, um, you know, in big picture, if you've got, you know, weathering in the ecosystem using what's there in these trace element posture, and then you're only adding a fraction of what's required back in your fertilizer, over time, things fall apart, right? So Again, that's why it's so important to think holistically here. If you can get these materials into your soil, the system can really manage itself on a whole another level. Um, so there's a principle called the cation exchange capacity. Uh, if you've ever done a soil test, like through extension, something like that, um, you've probably seen that metric on the soil test. Um, this is a function of how much clay and organic matter is in the soil. So earlier we talked about soil on paper being sand, clay, and organic matter. Well, sand is neutral. It doesn't hold anything, no water, no elements. It's just like the perlite in the soil. It's there for drainage. The, the clay and the organic matter have an, a net negative charge and opposites attract, positive attracts negative. So the cation exchange capacity, cation is positive, anion is negative, a little bit of chemistry class. But the cation exchange capacity is a measurement of how much organic matter and clay is in the soil. The more there is, the more it can hold, the less you have to irrigate and the less you have to fertilize. So it's really indicative of the soil's maturity. And you can think about it like a bucket or a gas tank. You know, the, the larger the ability of the soil to hold on to things, the less the human has to compensate. This is a kind of a schematic of that. You can see the clay particle has negative charges. You see all the elements around it all have positive charges. Most, the majority of what plants require is positively charged. So clay is strictly a negative entity. Organic matter actually has positive and negative binding sites. It's more complex. So it can hold all everything, in case you're wondering how the negative elements stay in the soil. So no matter if you have a high clay soil or a high sand soil, your effort is to increase the organic matter. That's, it's kind of an interesting thing. No matter either, either posture, you want to increase the organic matter. And that comes through mulch mowing your lawn and you know, encouraging the root development in your soil. And we'll see why in a second. Uh, but this principle holds in soil where, you know, what, what we do and is another image of it. You have this root and then it can come in and it can kind of decide what it needs when. You know, there's an intelligence in the soil and the ability of the soil to hold allows the plant to grow to that maturity. But this is uh, Dr. William Albrecht that I mentioned. If you, if you kind of focus on those percentages there, um, again, don't, no need to remember it. Just make the connection that there's a deliberate sweet spot in the soil of what it's holding. So if you have 100%, no matter what your exchange capacity is, what takes up that 100% should be 60, 70% calcium, 15% magnesium, 4 potassium, 3 sodium, and the rest are micronutrients. The point of that is to say that there is a place that life is moving to. And incidentally, this is what microbes and weeds are trying to move the system towards. 
Uh, so weeds are an indicator of deficiency, and we'll talk about that more directly in a sec. So this is not an exact science. It doesn't, uh, it's a range-based approach, but I'm gonna show you the significance of this. Um, so again, this is just another view. You can see the numbers are slightly different, but within that range, what, what we wanna focus on is the balance. What we tend to focus on is the pH. You know, most people are familiar with pH. When you're thinking about soil, many people are, are familiar with using lime to increase pH. That's kind of most of the time as far as we get. Um, and I'll show you in a minute why that's oversimplified. But pH ultimately, I'm not gonna get into the technicality of it, but it's a measurement of hydrogen ions. The more hydrogen present, the more acidic. So when you have that exchange capacity that's full of calcium and magnesium and potassium and sodium, et cetera, when it's deficient, what replaces those elements in the exchange capacity is hydrogen. So what an acidic soil means is that the soil is empty, that it's full of hydrogen and not what the plant needs to eat. So when you're adding lime, it's a calcium, it's a positive charge, it's, it's a stronger charge than hydrogen. The calcium kicks the hydrogen out and the pH goes up. So what that means is, it, I think it'll be easier to see on, this is just a, uh, a slide on the, the thickness of the line represents the availability of the elements. So again, this is not a human endeavor. This is where the system is moving to on its own. And what we're thinking about is how to encourage that within a balanced approach, not by what the number is on a piece of paper. And the irony is that if you get that range right that I was referencing, the pH is always perfect. So the pH is actually an afterthought of what you're doing. It should not drive your action. Now, I wanna show you why. Um, this is a typical soil in Wilmington. I've taken thousands of soil tests in Wilmington. And I don't go to the extension because they don't look for all of the essential elements, which are all listed there on the left. The extension is kind of like going to the doctor and the doctor prescribing a pill, um, rather than changing a diet, for example. Uh, it's a loose analogy, but it, it applies. What we're talking about here is, is looking at our blood samples, changing our diet, bringing balance to how we're approaching it. It's just a, it's a different track. So when you go to the extension, they're not going to look for all of the elements that we need to evaluate soil health. They're going to look for the macronutrients for pH, and they're going to give you recommendations accordingly. So in this scenario, if you followed any of, of what we've been talking about, um, is you see how the calcium is right at 60%? It's kind of almost to the range where you want it to be. You see how the uh, pH is five and a half? It's low, right? If you took this to the extension, they're going to tell you how much lime to use to make that five and a half number six and a half. It's an equation, right? And it, it will work. You can move that number with calcium, but you've already got enough calcium, just about, right? And so the element, look how deficient magnesium is. Look how deficient potassium is and the sodium and boron and et cetera, right? So you can make the pH perfect and have all the other elements be deficient. And, and, not, and have a completely unhealthy situation. But on paper, it's correct. And, and so this is a big misnomer in how we approach soil fertility. And what ends up happening is things like this. You got the right pH, 6.6. Uh, look how high the calcium is. This is a client that when we engaged them first had been using lime every year the way they were supposed to. And they're totally deficient in everything else. And their landscape looked terrible. You know, there's weeds growing everywhere. The fertility wasn't necessarily bad, but the weeds are there to try to bring the balance back to the situation. Just the same way we use them as medicinal herbs, right? Um, they're doing the same thing for the ecosystem. We've just evaluated them in a different way. So you have, this is a, a, one other one that I thought I'd show you with a, a back in a front yard client. Um, and, or I should say they had the back beds tested in the front yard long. And I, I put this on here just to show you how different the soil was in the same ecosystem, right? And that really highlights how impactful building a home is towards the quality of your soil. It's not necessarily your fault, right? It's not like you killed everything. And a lot of people try to do the right things, but the materials and, and the life force that is needed from the soil life that we'll talk about here in a sec is just not there. You know, these microbes, again, they don't jump over the fence. You have to be knowledgeable of them and ask. Uh, and go source them, you know, um, and that comes from compost. You can even, you know, go to uh, worms are an easy way to do that. Their gut microbes are fantastic for soil health, um, or even just going out to the forest and adding a cup of that forest soil to your compost pile. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways that you can do that. 
so so it kind of moves through some of the mineral talk that the takeaway from the minerals is that you know it's not just what the plant wants it's what the ecosystem wants we want to think about organic fertilizers because they come with a broader diversity of elements if you use miracle grow you've got seven or eight elements if you use something like fish emulsion it's got 50 or 60 elements without even having to think about it because it's from nature it's more complex right so that's going to give you a lot of benefit and the same mindset applies to microbes so you know microorganisms are everywhere you know and they're critical. I mean, try drinking a beer without yeast, right? Like it doesn't exist. It's a different thing completely, right? And it's the same way with cheese or kombucha or bread or vinegar or any of these materials, there's an alchemy involved, right? Where in the original material is taken into a new phase that life can use again, right? And, and that is the mindset that we want to be happening in the soil. And, and it's really that mindset that brings us success. And these numbers are quite extraordinary. There, there's a, a, another universe under our feet. You know, there's, you know, 10,000 species of bacteria. This is in a teaspoon of native grassland soil. Uh, this is actually much higher in compost where this process is being concentrated, uh, which is kind of hard to believe. But, you know, you have miles of fungal hyphae, the tentacles of fungi that branch out into the soil in a teaspoon. You have, I think it's like four miles of fungal hyphae in a teaspoon. It's, it's like trying to think about a trillion dollars. It almost doesn't add up. Um, so it's really important to get connected and get interested about these guys. This is kind of a silly little thing, but it's really, this guy on the left always reminds me of Harper Peterson. Um, I think that every time I see it, so I got to say it. But uh, this is actually happening right now at the Arboretum. It's called the Soil My Undies pro uh, Project. Lloyd Singleton, the director, did it, and they just buried it the other day. And the idea is, it was these are farmers in the Midwest that showed the impact of living soil, no-till soil, and conventional soil. The guy on the left was the control. The second from the left was the no-till. And you can see the undies are almost completely disintegrated. And, and the other two were more conventional, uh, so it didn't degrade in the same way. So it's, that's kind of a funny way of getting into the idea. But it's also important to, to uh, make the connection that, that this doesn't happen overnight, right? There is an, an investment here. There is patience that is involved. There is uh, trust, you know, in, the, in these natural living systems that you really can't get around. Um, and this is just an experiment out of the Netherlands. And I think this, the midterm was three years and the long term was seven years, if I'm not mistaken. But what they did is somehow, uh, I'm not sure how they did it, but they determined the communication between different microbial species in the soil and then drew a line from one to the other when that was. Uh, documented. And so you can see the ecosystem growing over time, you know, uh, and that's not to say you need to wait three years to see something at all. Uh, it's, it's simply to say that the benefit of this, for example, your soil ecosystem in your landscape feeding itself might take three years, you know. Um, in the meantime, if you're impatient and you see things happening that you don't want to see and you go out there with a selective herbicide or a fungicide to kill it, you're killing all of this, right? And you're stuck in that rut. So there really does need to come a moment where your commitment to what this, this how this works, not just what I'm saying, but you know, the commitment to how living systems work uh, really needs to be adopted um, to, to have the long-term success that we all want. So there's a term called the rhizosphere and that's the horizon between uh, the root, the, the biological plant and the soil. and there's all sorts of activity that happens. And one of the things that we take for granted, I referenced it earlier, is that plants feed the soil. You know, you can't take microbes out to a beach and put microbes in the, in the beach sand and grow soil. What grows soil is over half of what plants make for themselves in photosynthesis is exuded through the plant roots. Uh, it's a sugar meal, it's called an exudate. And there's this, this really amazing thought form that you know, if a plant is deficient in something, it can send a signal to the ecosystem to come bring it reinforcements. If those actors are not there, well, then that can't happen and the plant's just spinning its wheels, wasting its energy. But it, it can also choose, if it's deficient in boron, it can say, hey, boron cyclers, you know, here's a buffet for you, come help me, right? There's that natural intelligence that exists that, again, the human gets in the way of when we have chemical lawn care, and we're using artificial materials. So as we strengthen that intelligence in the soil, all of a sudden we start not to see the disease show up anymore. And we don't have the chinch bug problem in the lawn the way we did last year. And all of the problems go away and we're not spraying chemicals to stop them anymore, right? 
this is all spawned from our mindset uh, in allowing these things to be developed. So this is a, an electron microscope in, image on the right of ex exudates of, of, you know, basically these little sugar meals attracting the, these microbes to perform these functions that fertilizers and humans cannot perform. Um, what we're doing is what uh, the great Charles Walters, he started Acres USA, it's a fantastic magazine on natural growing. He called it toxic rescue chemistry. You know, the idea that, you know, we've sown the, the, the circumstances for these imbalances and deficiencies in our ecosystem. And then we go out there and try to kill them all back after we've created them. Uh, it's, you know, when you can see it in living color, it's quite insane, actually. Um, so this intelligence in soil, you know, if you've ever tended a compost pile, you see it steam on a cold day. You know, that's not ambient heat. That actually is the energy of microorganisms producing that heat. You can think about it like friction if you wanted to. But it's the, the life in the decomposition process that is creating that. It's a life force, visible. Um, and you, think about it. You know, you don't have to fertilize a forest. Um, and it grows trees, right? Now, again, is it, is it realistic to say we could, you know, just grow a forest in our, our landscape? That's really not the point. The point is to, to invest into the, the, the level of the living system that you're at and uh, understand that these systems have an innate capacity to maintain themselves. I've always found it interesting that, that you know, humus is the end result of, bio, of microbial decomposition. And the root of that word is humble, you know? And I, I really believe that, you know, some reverence for this type of, of, of you know, articulation of mother nature is, is really critical to get uh, to where we want to go here. And you can see some of the fungal hyphae that you can't see with your eye. You know, I, I go talk to a lot of, of school kids in their, in their classes, and it's always amazing to see, you know, when they can see through a microscope, it's something they're looking at and they can't see it. And then they see something move that they can't see with their eye. It changes them. You know, it's, it's really, really amazing. Um, so it's just these kinds of things could be more important. This, there's a term called the soil food web that uh, is the, the uh, statement for the activity that's happening in the soil. It's not unlike the ocean. You know, people are very familiar with the idea of plankton being the base of the food web in the ocean and feeding the largest organisms like the whales in the ocean. You know, that's a very good example to keep in mind. The same thing happens in the soil. If you don't have bacteria and the fungi and the protozoa and the nematodes that encompass the microscopic food web, you're not going to attract earthworms. You're not going to attract the birds. You're not, you know, the system builds from the bottom, right? If you don't have that base of food, you're, you're really not going to be able to accomplish uh, the type of, of uh, thriving landscape that you want. So here's a, uh, a visual of it. You know, at the top, you, you have the ecosystem, and you know, then it's giving me this visual of the different, what's called trophic levels. Each level here is called a trophic level, and it's, it's a life level. You know, the bacteria are the, you know, the, the, the primary decomposers, the fungi and the bacteria are actually using enzymes to break down the leaves that fall in a forest into humus, right? That's the process. And then the protozoa and the nematodes are eating the fungi and the bacteria. And those are all microscopic. Then you got the spider mites or the springtails or other arthropods, microarthropods that you can see that are eating those bacteria. Same with worms, right? Worms don't eat uh, the leaves. They eat what's eating the leaves. So a lot of people that want to buy worms and put them in their garden and they haven't adopted living soil methods, the worms are just going to go somewhere else. There's no need to buy worms. If you get that ecosystem right in your soil, even if it's a raised bed and you're growing biologically, the worms will come. It's actually one of those indicators that you're on the right path. It's one of the first, actually. When you start spraying compost tea after having chemical lawn care, and you make the point of go looking in your soil and digging around, you don't see anything. And after a couple of weeks, maybe a month, you start to see more worms. It's a really exciting thing because you can see it, right? And, and that's, that's something that, that, you know, when you have to be patient with something like this, it's really important to pay attention up front. Because if you don't go take an inventory of what things are and how it looks, like how deep your roots go and these types of things, it's really easy to take for granted that nothing's happening. Um, so this, this soil food web is a really fascinating place to spend some time uh, looking around. And, you know, go to YouTube and, and search for some of the videos that, that you can find. Uh, on some of these organisms. This is, in, as far as uh, micro images go, this is a really famous one. Uh, it's an electron microscope image of a fungi, a beneficial fungi capturing uh, a parasitic nematode. You know, 
if you say nematode to someone who knows what it is, 99% of the time, their mindset is that nematodes are harmful. It turns out that only 1% of nematode species are parasitic, eat plants. And it, and it just happened, our mindset of that is, comes from the fact that we can see it happening. We can see the damage it's doing to our plants, right? And we just completely take for granted all the beneficial nematodes that are in the soil that are really their job is to eat the grubs and the chinch bugs and the mole cricket and the ground pearl and all the things that can't be killed by chemicals. All of those are balanced out by beneficial nematodes. Matter of fact, that's what I would recommend you buy if you had that problem and you wanted to get it gone quickly. It's like unleashing a bunch of sharks in the kiddie pool and it gets rid of the, rid of the problem really quickly. It's amazing. Um, but this image is of a parasitic nematode that tend to be thriving in dead soil because there's nothing there to balance them out. They've got no predator, right? So in this scenario, you've got this fungi that's got kind of a life preserver's type, you know, round circle, and it's spitting out some pheromones to attract these uh, uh, parasitic nematodes. And the nematode sticks its head in, and it swells up and captures it and digests it, not unlike a Venus flytrap or something like that. So this is happening all out in your soil for all of the things that we view, even fire ants, you know, you name it. All of the things that are there and out of balance are there because they have nothing to check it in the ecosystem. So if our inclination is to go try to kill that with chemicals, we're basically signing ourselves up for a perpetuity of chemical lawn control. And, and the only way out of that is to grow the soil's capacity um, or to use a natural uh, pesticide that, that would work as a stopgap. This is not about just deal with your problems and let them be and hope that the ecosystem gets rid of them all for you in the amount of time that you need. There's still ways to, to make progress working against these guys without working against ourselves. Uh, and that, that's also a big takeaway. So I wanted to just kind of walk through the end of this addressing specific problems that people have, because I think it really gives a, a clear window of how the mindset is so powerful in this. You know, t people tend to think that pests on their plants are bad luck. You know, it's almost like they flew by our neighborhood and they just landed on our plant, you know? And if, if that was the truth, and if that's our inclination, then it's not surprising that we would go out and try to kill the pest, you know, get rid of it, right? The reality is the pests, and you can see the antenna on some of these pests, particularly the mobile ones, um, but they're attracted to unhealthy plants. And it's actually kind of far out, uh, and it's amazing. But it's like old school TV antenna, you know, when you have a plant that especially I mentioned obese plants earlier, you know, where we're growing that plant up at the expense of its roots. What we're doing that with is typically nitrogen, which is speeding up the metabolism of the plant and creating this obesity and this visual growth that we're seeing. And what's in that plant is empty proteins. And back to science class for one sec. A protein is made up of amino acids. It's a chain of amino acids that makes up a protein. A, a pest cannot digest a complete protein. It's not food for the pest. What's, what's food for the pest is the amino acids, the incomplete proteins. And what happens when we force feed plants nitrogen is the plant can't help but eat it. It's growing, it's obese. It's got all, its metabolism of the plant actually can't keep up with what it's taking in. So you have all of these empty proteins floating around in the plant. And the amino acids, the empty proteins, the broken proteins, actually emit specific frequencies that the pests are attuned to. So literally, the pest in the infrared sees the food on the unhealthy plant and is attracted to it. So with that understanding, if we're growing unhealthy plants, we're going to get pest infestations. And if we're not connected to the surface of this reality, our inclination is to go try to kill the pest with a synthetic pesticide that's going to residually kill everything of life in the soil and the strength of the ecosystem and again stick us in that vicious cycle. So again, there are natural pesticides that you can use, but the takeaway here is that pests are not uh, bad luck. They, I actually saw a cucumber operation. It was in a greenhouse in Texas one time, and it was a hydroponics. And one of them had sea minerals, and the other one didn't. It was just the fertilizer, the base fertilizer. And they had a white fly infestation, which is that pest on the upper right there. Um, and it was unbelievable. It was like 95, 90% of the white flies were on the hydroponic plants without the sea minerals. And it was just a, a stark visual. I mean, there's nothing separating these plants, right? So it, it's, it's actually quite amazing. And, we, and when you invest in this idea of strengthening the ecosystem, strengthening your plants, giving them a broader diversity of elements to work with, and then a broader diversity of microbes to be in communion with, then you're mitigating the need for the pests to come in and try to recycle that plant 
into something that can strengthen the ecosystem. It's trying to turn the plant into compost, essentially, right? It's doing what it's supposed to be doing. Um, and what you end up with is scenarios like, you know, mole cricket, chinch bug, ground pearl. These are three that are primarily, if you go to a lawn care company and you have these problems in your landscape, people are going to say, oh, you can't kill those with chemicals. And the reason for that is that all three of these in their life cycle have a stage that is protected by an armor, right? And all of the life cycle is not in the nymph stage where it's vulnerable and in the, in the adult stage where it's not. So if you spray a chemical, you might kill the grubs and the nymphs that are vulnerable, but you're not going to kill the armor ones. And you never get rid of the problem unless you spray the chemicals every week, which is actually not legal uh, in most cases, thankfully. But uh, even if it was, it wouldn't be cost effective. Um, so the point here is if you have beneficial nematodes in your soil and you have your ecosystem set up properly, any pest that's going to rear its head to try to grow and, and populate is going to be checked by an increase of uh, the, the nematodes. It's like if you have more zebras on the plane, you're going to have more lions, right? If you have less, you're going to have less. It's, there's a balance there. And if you can you know, grasp that concept, that's really all that we need to eliminate any issue that we face from a pest in a landscape. Um, so, you know, ground pearl tends to be in a circular like this, but um, we have all three of those problems in, in Wilmington. And it's because our, our soil is very poor and it doesn't sustain the soil food web. Um, so chemicals will not do the job there. And there's a lot of frustrated homeowners out there with these problems because they try all the different lawn care companies and they're all doing the same thing and just not going to get rid of the problem. It's getting back to this idea of balance, right? Um, Moles are another good example of that. They're, they're, you see how many grubs are over there in that picture on the left. You know, a mole doesn't dig through the earth for nothing, right? It's, it's got a sonar that can seed as food. So you can chase the moles till you're blue in the face. But if you don't get rid of the buffet that's in your lawn and the grubs are there out of balance, again, because there's no life in the soil to eat them, right? And this is, again, a function of beneficial nematodes that are only going to be around and sustain when you have the bacteria and the fungi and the, pro and the protozoa. You have the balance of the ecosystem. So literally, I've, I can't tell you how many, literally hundreds of times I've helped homeowners with, lawn, with moles simply through compost tea when we used to do progressive gardens. And the moles would just end up in the neighbor's yard, you know, uh, literally. And it, it's, it's incredible. So these things can seem too simple um, and they might take a minute, but they absolutely work. And, and so weeds is another one. Uh, weeds are, you know, a plant that's been deemed to be growing in the wrong place. They're actually what's called dynamic accumulators. They grow as an annual plant, which means they complete their life cycle in one season. And you have cool and warm season weeds, and you'll see different spectrums of them in the different seasons that we have. And so the idea is the grass that we typically try to grow is a perennial crop, right? The weed is an annual. There's a term called succession, where you have, if you burned an acre, you know, what starts to grow initially is the annual plants. It's preparing the maturity in the soil, then the perennial, then the shrub, then the tree, the old growth forest, right? So nature is moving in this maturity level, in this, in this method of maturity, that weeds are the first, uh, the first players. So when we see a lot of weeds in our landscape, what that says is our soil is really immature. You know, it's either that this, it's, there's compaction because there's no life in the soil, and the weeds, you know, you see weeds growing it through concrete, right? They're really strong and they break the soil up. Um, you know, and there's, you know, we talked earlier about how weeds are medicinal herbs, you know, and you can look at um, you know, weeds like chickweed, which we have around here. You can use it in salads. You know, it's really high in nutrient density. So every year when the weeds fix these high amounts of nutrients, then they die every year, right? They're an annual and they're returning that to the topsoil. So the depth of the roots brings up these trace elements, fixes it from the air, alchemy, however nature works. You have these high amounts of these beneficial elements, and then they die to return it to the topsoil as a method of maturing the soil. So literally, the weeds want the grass to grow. That's the reality. Now, we've talked ourselves out of that reality. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that you should just let your landscape go to weeds if that's not what you want. But that, you know, if you're not working within this reality, um, you're never going to get out of it and your problem is going to get worse. You know, dandelion is, is a better example. It's, if you ever try to pull one up, you know, it's taproot. It feels like it goes down to the middle of the earth, right? It's, it's way down in the soil. And its role, it has a direct role in calcium sequestration, which is one of the reasons why it's such a, a, a beneficial uh, element. Um, 
I mean, a uh, plant, uh, an herb in that respect. I'd make a dandelion tea almost every day uh, out of the roots and the leaves. They have different properties. But the idea here is that, I, you know, I'm from Greensboro and really middle of the state in the Piedmont, really high clay so soil content, um, really deficient in calcium. And we have dandelions everywhere. And in Wilmington, I showed you that typical Wilmington soil. We tend to not have calcium deficiencies at the extreme, um, even though we do in some cases. But we don't have a lot of dandelions growing around here. We have false dandelions more than we have real dandelions. And the reason for that is because the ecosystem doesn't require it. I mean, you've blown a dandelion seed before. We don't live in bubbles, right? And people think, you know, weeds are coming from the neighbor's yard. Well, you know, weeds, seeds can stay dormant for up to 50 years in the soil. So the mechanism of the wheat, the seed bank in your lawn already exists. What, what it's responding to is the level of maturity in the soil. And if the soil is not conducive to supporting perennial grass growth, well, then you're going to get weeds everywhere. And that's basically what we deal with. So the way out of that is to grow the soil's capacity and mitigate the impulse that that weed is responding to, to need to grow. And you literally outcompete the weed with the strength of your turf. Um, and it, it, there's really no way around that if you're going to do it naturally. So again, I mean, you know, this is our reality with weed seeds. And it's a common story. The, you know, my neighbor's got all these weeds, and you know, especially with chemical lawn care companies that don't want to see a weed. Um, and it, again, you can see how caught up into, in a story that people are. And that's you know, not a fault. It's just our reality. So it, if we want to have success in these things, it's really about stepping into a new way of thinking about them. And then, you know, the, the third one being disease, you know, when we referenced this earlier, you know, the plant disease is really no different than human disease in, in terms of a, a, a nutritional and a nourishment capacity. Um, so when we strengthen the ecosystem from the plant's perspective, we're going to allow it to withstand disease. But more importantly, we're going to balance the disease out by having beneficial microorganisms in the ecosystem that uh, are responsible for, for beating them back. You know, here's these two products are, are some that I sold in Progressive Gardens, and they're beneficial bacteria products, different bacterias uh, that perform different functions. And this is one place where singular or, you know, maybe not diverse microbes make sense is when you're battling disease. You can literally unleash, you know, a, a, a higher population than nature would be able to muster on her own of these beneficial bacteria that are going to eat the target disease, and you can balance it out. So these thing, kinds of things are really effective in that one or two or three seasons that you're working on in the interim while you're strengthening your ecosystem. You can still attack your disease problems or your pest problems. Just do it with biological agents, with natural materials, not materials that are going to obliterate everything and try to nuke it, you know? Um, so I wanted to end with just some examples. Um, this, is, this was kind of amazing to me. Um, I, this is a long time ago, but we set up some sod we had extra in this little grid and planted it. And then I, I used, uh, on the right, I used compost tea from the store. And on the left, I didn't. And this was in through the fall. And then it, this sat outside all winter. And this was, and it wasn't even planned. I kind of forgot about it. And then I went out there and I looked at it. And this was in spring, right around when you start reaching 80 degrees Fahrenheit, 60 degrees at night. It's called the 80-60 rule. That's when the perennial turf turns on and it starts to, to grow again. And when you've got to start mowing, that kind of thing. Uh, before that, it stays dormant. So this was right at that cusp. And you can see the growth on the right, how much more pronounced it is than the left. This was an identical situation other than compost tea. And it was actually stopped being applied three months before this. So it, it's just, it was anecdotal, but it was quite striking to see how much more capable the soil was of, of stimulating growth. And these are a little bit more drastic. This was Laney Field. Um, in micro makers used to be uh, the name of the compost tea brewers that we built for a wholesale company that I had. And this was, I think, weekly or bi-weekly tea applications. Uh, my business partner at the time, his son was going to school there. So um, he made an example out of it. And you can actually see the soil on the bottom and right above the eight months there. Like you can almost, you can see how the soil grew, you know. Um, it, it, it's really, again, quite amazing. And this one was a fun one. We, we used to have a worse lawn in Wilmington. Uh, contest and we give a you know free applications to the people who won the award and this lady won it uh, her lawn was a war zone and you know after eight months of, of applying tea and and you know stimulating these kind of types of processes uh, it had obviously come a, a long way um, 
So, you know, I won't read through all of these, but this is a little simple little flow chart of, uh, you know, how we put together some of the, the benefits when we were doing a natural approach of uh, living solutions versus not. Um, this is not just the right thing to do. It costs more to grow with chemicals. It's just indirect. You know, if you get a Chemlon quote, it's going to be in the bottom of the barrel. It's going to be really cheap for the fertilizers they use, but they're not going to quote you for the pesticides you're going to need, you know, and the fungicides, et cetera, right? And I'm not going to say it's conscious on their part. I think it's more just an unconscious way that, of how that works. But the reality is, you know, this was kind of a rough estimate of what we were doing on the left. We were more expensive the first year because we were bringing in compost and we were we did a detox where we initially aerated, we brought in compost, and then we sprayed tea consistently and did soil testing at the end of the year based on that uh, balance of mineral approach uh, that I described. And I still do that service. Um, it's $25 and you can get a, a soil test solutions prescription that actually tells you what to add based on your, your deficiencies. If you combine that with diverse microbes, then you're mitigating the large part of the expense of a lawn care uh, approach. Um, so I just wanted to mention uh, this food lawn project that I'm starting and it's, it's consulting uh, where I'd come out to your house and we'd actually kind of get into the, to the details of this type of stuff uh, specific to your landscape. And then I'll work with a group of contractors and farmers that uh, can build chicken coops, put in beehives, build raised beds and turn your front yard or backyard into a farm if you wanted to. And you kind of take a stepwise approach where the first pass is we got to be thinking about this right. Like if you're going to have a food lawns project and you're going to want to grow soil and do this capacity, we, you don't need a chemical lawn care company, right? You really don't want glyphosate in your garage. You know, let's go through an audit of the, the fertilizers that you're using and understand how we can, you know, check those things off the list and not have to worry about them working against us. Then once we're coherent and all in roses have pointed in the right direction, then we can bring in the farming and actually bring in a level of value to your landscape that's not there uh, to start with. And, my, my dream with this is ultimately to have a cooperative farm that is grown decentralized, where there's certain crops, could be honey, could be eggs, could be uh, ginger or turmeric or basil or whatever crops that we choose. And when you opt in, you can grow those crops that will pay you for them. Um, and you can make five, ten thousand dollars a year out of your landscape. Uh, so that that's that's the goal. Um, but you know, we'd love to talk to anybody about um, that as we go. And, uh, you know, just uh, remember these takeaways and um, I'm happy to answer any, any questions if you have them, but that's, that's what I have to talk about today. Thanks so much, Evan. I do have a couple questions for you. Yeah. Um, one is, um, is there a right way to use herbicides to like kill vines? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, you know, vines, particularly those, the real nasty ones with the thorns, you know, it's been my experience and I think it's fairly accepted that the, the, the stronger your impulse of things like that, the, the more immature the soil is, you know? So it, it's an, it is a signal of that. Now you, you can't really out, you can't wait for your ecosystem for the vines. So there is a, actually I could show you this. I think I, I pulled it up. Um, yeah. So, you know, most people, this is a preferred product list for um, being able to replace synthetic chemicals in your landscape. So it's not that, um, or actually, no, I'm not sharing my screen, sorry. So it's not that you can't use things. Um, it's that you just want to be mindful of what you're using. So typically what's used is Roundup. Um, which has the active ingredient glyphosate, which is not the most dangerous chemical in the world as terms of its toxicity, direct, especially directly to humans. And there's a whole dialogue there, but, but it's, it's extremely noxious and it's at the center of our chronic health uh, problem uh, on earth right now. And so Roundup is a big no-no there's, and there's replacement products, um, you know, the suppress and the sky, you know, all of these non-selective, what that means is it's not going to choose between the weed in your lawn and your grass. When you have a selective herbicide, it's always toxic because what they're doing is they're creating enzyme inhibitors that, you know, a weed is uh, a, a dicot, uh, which means it's got a, a, a stem and, and branches and your grass is what's called a monocot, which has blades of growth. 
and there's an enzyme that works on the dye cotton, not the monocotton. Um, so any selective thing is going to be that way. But typically, non-selective is used for for vines. And if you, as long as you choose something like this um, that's not working against the ecosystem and it's not water soluble and synthetic in that way, uh, it should should be fine. Um, there's no there's really no strategy that I'm aware of to prevent them physically. You know, I've not experienced mulch working or you know anything like that. Um, so outside of replacing something that's you know, you know, is chemical based and that you don't want to use and finding a replacement, you know, physically removing them is really the only option. Um, and that, that especially like, I, I'm an enemy of wisteria, you know, it, I, wisteria is like, it's unbelievable that plant, the way that it grows. But if you're trying to get something like that or bamboo out of your landscape, those are probably the hardest. Um, but yeah, outside of replacing uh, what you're using or pulling them off, there's really not much better than that. Okay, cool. Um, and then recently we got some trees taken out of our yard and the tree people, they mulched some of the, the living trees for us. We wanted to use it in our landscape for like erosion um, and around just like the beds. Um, and we didn't know if we could use untreated mulch. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So it, it raises a couple of things that you can um, find when you look out into internet world, right? It's like, you know, don't use mulch because it, it pulls nitrogen out of your soil is a typical connection. Uh, another one being, you know, don't use treated wood. Um, and, and so on the nitrogen front, you know, what's happening with the microbes that we talked about today is that they're using uh, about a two to one by volume, uh, by weight, um, carbon to nitrogen. And so carbon is, this gets into kind of the composting mentality when you want to balance that, that the by weight of your bin, two to one, actually I said weight, it's by volume, two to one by volume carbon to nitrogen, which means if you're unconsciously putting in food waste from your kitchen that's fresh or nitrogen based, then you want twice that volume in wood chips or newspaper or paper or something, right? And if you, if you maintain the looseness of that balance, then the microbes have the buffet that they need to thrive and do their work. If you have it inverted, then it's going to discourage them. You're going to get compaction. You're going to get um, anaerobic conditions, the odors, things like that. So in the soil, this, 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 that's the way the natural process happens. I mean, the mindset is, you know, the trees in a forest don't eat the leaves that fall to the ground, right? They eat what the microbes in the soil make out of it. They eat that humus that the microbes make, right? So when we have that visual, that's exactly what we're encouraging in a compost pile. You know, in, in effect, our entire ecosystem, our entire landscape should be a compost pile. And it will be when you grow biologically. That's how it should happen. So that process is happening wherever microbes are present. So if you're adding a bunch of carbon, the mindset is, well, then any nitrogen that's available in the soil needs to be utilized by the microbes and taken away from the plant to finish the decomposition process. And literally speaking, that is true. And could you get a nitrogen efficiency from a situation with a bunch of wood chips if you didn't, um, you know, weren't aware of this? Possibly, you know, that, that, that has happened, which is why people talk about it. But it's something that can be easily overcome with fertilization, you know, using organic fertilization. And, and I would argue that the process of the decomposition that you're stimulating is creating exponentially more benefit than taking away nitrogen. Um, Ultimately, that dialogue is driven by the central importance that conventional agriculture has made out of nitrogen more than anything. Um, and as we've talked about here, there's a lot more going on than nitrogen. What's really interesting is that that really is a, is, is a highlight of how much of a crutch that we've made out of the mentality that we bring to this. Like if you go to Logan Labs and you get a soil test, they don't even test for nitrogen. You know, 70% of the air we breathe is nitrogen. There's a whole uh, ecosystem or whole trophic levels of, of bacteria that are nitrogen fixers in the soil. Uh, leg legumes are nitrogen fixers. You know, people are familiar with those, uh, the symbiotic relationship of certain microbes and, and legumes that fix nitrogen from the air. So, you know, all of this happens uh, for us in this way if we're knowledgeable of it. Another example that comes to mind is mulch mowing your lawn. You know, an easy way to remember the carbon nitrogen browns to greens kind of thing is if you mow your grass and you had it in a pile, it would be green. After a week, days, whatever, it's turned brown, right? It's the nitrogen has been lost to the air. 
So it's off gassed, right? And it's not in the soil anymore. So when you are mulch mowing your lawn and you're using chemical conventional approaches, what you can end up with is a thatch layer, right? And sometimes you can hire a lawn care company to come rake it off. Well, that's a really good indication that your soil's dead, right? Um, and so you should never end up with a thatch layer. It just means the soil has no ability to generate decomposition and there's no microbes in the soil. So once we've adopted these principles and we start to get that natural engine flowing and we're mulch mowing in the lawn, we're retaining so much more nitrogen that again, to back to the question, the people that are saying, oh, it's gonna pull the nitrogen from you, they're in this little tiny box, you know? They're not thinking about the ecosystem and the ability and where nitrogen can come from, from the air, through microorganisms. Matter of fact, you go read about composting and nine out of 10 articles don't even mention a microorganism. You know, we're so crippled in how we're allowing ourselves to think about these things. I went to my, last year's my daughter's uh, class, science class, seventh, no, sixth grade that I went. And I saw the curriculum and I went with my microscope, showed the kids micro videos and freaked them out a little bit. And uh, long story short, they, the microbes, they had soil science in their curriculum and it talked about fertility and pH and hydrology and things that are relevant, but nothing about anything alive in the soil. There was no reference to microorganisms. So we're not invited to know about this to begin with, right? And you know, you can get cynical or not, it really doesn't matter. But at the end of the day, if we get interested in this and we start looking at how this works, you can really see clearly how big of a delineation there is in terms of what the experts are gonna tell you to do and then how natural living systems work. Um, so again, if we can gain that confidence in, in our, our, our mindset and then start to take an inventory of how that works in our ecosystem and get a couple small wins under us, it's really just a matter of patience and time and it gets better and better and better and better every year. So, so that, that was the carbon and nitrogen and the treated wood thing is, um, you know, if you, if you don't want treated wood for a weight raised bed or to use treated mulch, but that's really coming from outside. And, you know, I know I had a, a friend of mine just get a load of mulch from a local provider and the stink horn mushrooms are a big problem there. And those are no fun. I mean, you can get rid of them just plucking them and, you know, they're unsightly and all that, but it's not the end of the world. Um, but it's no fun having said that, but that, that's the concern people have with bringing mulch in in that regard, and the treated nature of it is simply just a matter of it's treated with chemicals that you don't want to invite into your soil. It's not gonna help the life of the soil. So any, any mulch that would come from your landscape is ideal. Um, it couldn't get any better than that. Cool, awesome. Yeah. I had a question about, um, so we have compost, um, and then every time I weed the garden, I think I don't wanna put my weeds in my compost because eventually I'm gonna put my compost in my garden and I wouldn't want the weeds in the garden. But um, is that when you were talking about um, weeds being annuals, then I was thinking, oh, well, maybe they don't survive long enough that it wouldn't, you know, matter. Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. Um, so the reality of, so there's a couple things. I'm not as sensitive. If you're composting right, that's not a problem because the, the heat that yeah. is attained will sanitize it. Okay. And I've experienced that and it, it, it's real. Now, if you want to avoid that, I, I don't necessarily blame you. There's nothing wrong with it. But in my mindset, you do want to get the weeds back into the ecosystem because what they're fixing, if you remove it and take it away, is like that, you know, it's not as important if you're adding all the good stuff back, right? But in, in principle, if you're taking that away, then it needs to be compensated for, right, in some way. Um, and, and again, that's not an exact science. But one thing that's really cool that comes to mind that I saw this guy do, and I've never done this, but I'm going to, is to collect the weeds in, in, in a water, in like a, a drum. And what this guy was doing, it was fascinating. He was weeding and then he was steeping it in a, a big drum anaerobically, which means outside of oxygen. Um, and anaerobic microbes, so back up one step. Aerobic microbes are what we wanna encourage in a landscape. That means with oxygen. Anaerobic means without oxygen. When you drive by the marsh at low tide and you smell the smells, that's anaerobic decomposition because of all the moisture in the, in the marsh, right? So that's what you smell in a compost pile when the balances ratios are wrong. You know, you're adding too much fresh stuff to the carbon and it's too wet or whatever the situation is. Um, so you start to get those odors. So the anaerobic microbes, however, even though they're not what you want in soil, and they also tend to encapsulate most of the pathogenic organisms, that doesn't mean at all that anaerobic microbes are pathogenic. There's absolutely beneficial uh, anaerobic microbes. But there's also the term, just kind of take one more step, called facultative. That means 
a, a, a single microbe species could be either anaerobic or aerobic, which allows a kind of a resiliency in the ecosystem, you know? So with that switch, what you want to encourage in soil is aerobic, which is why we turn compost, why we might aerate soil. Uh, we want the roots to be able to breathe and respire, right? And so what I'm driving at here is when you put herbs in a bucket uh, or weeds in a bucket with water on it, you're creating an anaerobic scenario and you're creating what's called an, an extract. Um, so the microbes break down the tissue, the anaerobic microbes, and then they, ex they expose all of the beneficial elements and materials that the weed had. And then you can strain off the weeds and use the liquid and return it to the ecosystem, you know? And I thought that was brilliant because really what that bucket represents is the ideal fertilizer for your landscape. It, it gets rid of the weeds and then leverages that back to the, to the landscape. And I, I, I've never, I hadn't played enough to say, you know, how well it works. It can't not work on some level, but that, that's one way you could go about it. But I, I would say, you know, if, if you're composting and you can feel the heat from the compost that you're doing and you've got a process that I wouldn't really be concerned with. Okay. And then I know I can research it online and stuff, but I just, maybe a short answer. Um, how do you make compost tea? Yeah. So I mentioned extract. Um, so there's kind of two compost tea is the, the act of growing microorganisms. Um, and there's a term extraction means you're running water through finished compost and you're extracting the microbes out and you're spraying them around. That's beneficial. But what people tend to mean with compost tea is what's called actively aerated compost tea. AACT is the acronym. And it, think about it like an aquarium for fish that you're aerating the water so the fish can breathe. Well, you're aerating a bucket, a five gallon bucket for a visual with an air pump in it and an air stone, just like an aquarium. You're aerating that water, you're putting the humus in there, the finished microbes, uh, compost, and the microbes can breathe. And then you feed those microbes with uh, organic food sources like molasses or fish or kelp or bat guano or something that's unrefined, but that's soluble ideally. So it flows through a sprayer or something like that. And in the presence of food and oxygen, the microbes grow to extraordinary concentrations beyond what nature could produce, beyond what a compost pile could produce. And it's actually a good connection to make. You know, we talked about the prairie soil and how it was concentrated, but compost was more concentrated. Composting, the word that we give to it, really means we're concentrating a natural process for human benefit, right? We're leveraging that process happening on the forest floor. We're bringing it in, idealizing it, maybe turning it once a week, maybe not. But, uh, but making it happen faster. Compost tea is an order of magnitude beyond composting. So when you're wanting to grow your soil biologically, there's no better way to do it. You know, you could take your compost, put it in a bucket, some black strap from the, from the covered molasses, and just mix up a brew, let it brew for at least 12 hours, say overnight, you know, a day, 12 to 24 hours. And then that solution, you can spray it around your landscape and just make more progress. And, and, I, and it, it lets me, I think this is a really good kind of, capstone to all of this. These microbes are like construction workers, right? The fertilizers are the building materials. So if we're using, if we're trying to build a neighborhood and we're bringing the construction workers the wrong spec homes and the wrong tools and artificial fertilizers, they're not going to be efficient, right? And the trace elements are like the tools, right? So, so the microbes actually make enzymes to break down organic matter and they, all of the elements have an enzyme potential. So if we've got all of the trace elements and all of the diversity of the elements, all of the diversity of the construction worker microbes, and we're bringing organic fertilizers in the form of, you know, building materials that work for them, they're going to build the neighborhood, right? Once that neighborhood's built, it takes on a life of its own. In the meantime, it's our job as the contractor to move the things around, you know? And that, that's just a really kind of simple way to remember what we're doing. Um, so ultimately, you know, if, if you're encouraging methods that reinforce that, you win. Cool. Do you have any other questions? I don't think so. Thank you so much for your time and all this knowledge. And yeah, it's of course. great. Thank y'all. Yeah, keep yeah. it coming. Really appreciate y'all and uh, your group. I'm happy to be a part of it.